right, guys. Well, welcome to another episode of Millennials in Ministry. I'm your host, Aaron V. Lashley, and today I'm really privileged to have on the show with me Pastor Chris Townley, who is a co-founding pastor of Kaleo Church in downtown Phoenix, Arizona. Um, he's married. He is uh, an all-star basketball star, so, uh, apparently. I just found that out as well. And um, he's really talented in a lot of really great things. But I've sat down, had the privilege of sitting down with you a few times to um, just chat about life and ministry. And I wanted to bring that conversation to the podcast because I found it to be so valuable. So first off, just thank you for being here with us. And it's great to have you. Yeah, of course. Thanks for asking me. Excited. Excited of to have the conversation. For sure. So first question out the gate, you know, of course, for people who don't know you, talk a little bit about how you got into full-time ministry. Yeah. Um, I mean, like all stories, it can be a, a long story and a short story. I'll try to do the the middle one, the middle version of that. I'm a preacher, so sometimes long-winded. Um, okay. I, I, I always had, um, I think, a desire to teach specifically would be a part of that or um, uh, a desire to influence. And so um, when I went to college, uh, I did I did go to college to play basketball. So okay. I, I don't think all-star is what I would put in front of that. But, I mean, hey, they, they paid for some school, <laughs> okay. so I'll that's, take that. That's not what they're saying on the street. They're saying on the street, <laughs> you're, you're a really good three-point shooter. That's what I hear. So. Uh, okay, that, that's fair. I'll take that compliment. Um, so, yeah, I went to college. Basketball was one of the, the, the main things that uh, was going on there. And, but I got my degree in elementary education. And so, so I wanted to teach. I wanted to, I don't know, have a, have a positive impact on lives. Um, that, that was probably always inside of me. And then during my time in college, um, a, a part of a couple uh, different just ministry opportunities with, with our college uh, community and then uh, working with, you know, high school and middle school students as well. And something started stirring in, in that time that, that maybe this would be something I, I would want to give my life to or however you wrestle out um, the things you're called to in the world. Uh, and then after so finished, finished college, um, graduated college, got married, and, and my wife and I moved back to the hometown we'd been from and, and kind of, you know, as 22, 23 year olds are doing, trying to figure out what we're going to do with our lives. Uh, and ministry, I guess, as an idea was still was still there. And so just uh, sought out a church there, got, got involved, uh, connected with some people because we, we knew the, the community uh, of people there. And, yeah. and, I got, and I had an opportunity when I was there uh, working with middle school and high school students to, to preach. And I hadn't really like ever preached before. Uh, I mm -hmm. taught a lot um, through basketball, through, um, you know, just regular teacher uh, of an elementary school. And, and something like started to come alive um, in the in the context of preaching over time, like kind of one one thing led to another volunteering. Oh, OK, here's a little bit of an internship. Things happened um, with some shifting in, in leadership at that time. And and it was kind of like presented with this opportunity that um, kind of confirmed maybe what what was happening in, in my spirit and the things that God was inviting me into. And, and so said yes to being a, a youth pastor without having any idea what I was saying yes to at yeah. that time. <laughs> That's typically how the stories go. Right. <laughs> right? Just yeah. Getting into, but once you're in, you know, it's something you're supposed to do. So yeah. that's really awesome. I, I want you to talk a little bit more about um, Kaleo and yeah. how you and Chase became co-pastors together. And then the model that you guys um uh, it's really ingrained into the culture of Kaleo, I feel like, is yeah. the table gathering and that whole thought process. Talk to yep. us a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it, as all of our stories are, my mind's all kind of connected. So when I was working with um, students, food was always um, a big part of that. Not like, um, not like your typical youth group food cliche thing. It was more like, mm -hmm. well, how can we get around the table and, and experience something um, meaningful, uh, connective with one another as we do that. And so it had always kind of been in me, I guess, to, to figure out how to eat together as, uh, how do we eat together as a community? And so that started way back when, um, when I was in, I was in Montana doing um, youth ministry stuff. 
tried to implement it after I'd moved to Phoenix, doing some ministry stuff, then transitions happened. And I met Chase, my co-pastor, um, in, in the midst of all of this, a, a mutual friend put us on one another because uh, the things I was always talking about, apparently, Chase was always talking about to this friend. And he, this friend was like, yeah. I don't want to talk to you guys about it anymore. You two should talk about it. <laughs> Uh, yeah. so, so he, so he hooked us up with one another and, um, you know, we just kind of got to know each other even just as friends, but this common theme of, of eating together of, of maybe even uh, like table theology, uh, mm-hmm. what does it mean to, to, to be at the table with one another? What does it mean to eat, eat the elements, you know, like, as opposed to like, you know, like Jesus didn't say take and sip, you know, he said, take and eat. So, so how do we like come, yeah. you know, come fully together uh, and eat those things um, as a community? I think we see that that modeled in the in the Acts church and the early church in general. Uh, Jesus leaves us with a meal as as the end of that, and and a lot of things happen when you start to eat around the table and you identify Jesus as the host of that table. That mm-hmm. um, Jesus is present with one another, that Jesus is present in the elements still, the, the, the bread and the wine that are representative yeah. of all of that. But, but also Jesus is, is present as the, the community gathers in that place yeah. too. So talk a little bit too about like practically how that's implemented in a service. Like I have I've yeah. had the privilege of attending, you know, before COVID happened and everything. But, um, you know, if somebody comes to See, I told you the street. Yeah, I know. Right, I, yeah, I told you. That's what Thank they you, said. Justin. Thank you. But yeah, um, talk about like if someone comes to your church, what how, what does the service look like, and how yeah. do you coordinate the gathering into that? The team yeah, and gather? yeah, that that that's a good question. Uh, and and it was you, you made it just in time. I think I think you were at our last gathering before mm-hmm. uh, we had I to know. suspend them. Yeah, crazy. Um, yeah. So so Kaleo's. Um, kind of crafted our, our gatherings um, around the, this concept of essentially the, the climax of what we do together is we eat. Um, and, and so, you know, we have our own um, liturgical elements. Every, every church has some sense of a liturgy, the things they follow uh, and yeah. why they do what they do. And, and so we intentionally at, at conclude our gatherings with a meal, so even just language uh, about that is, so we don't we don't have a meal afterwards, you know. We have a meal as a part of our gathering. It just mm-hmm. is right outside in a different location, um, you know. So so we 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 shape our gatherings around a couple different things. One is just to follow in the rhythms of Jesus and, and the way that we talk about that, and the, the the way that we try to implement that and lead people into that and guide people around that is is we watch Jesus uh, humbly seek the presence of God to be formed as the family of God, to join in the mission of God. So those elements are, are tied into all of that. And I think actually you see all three uh, of those, like, you know, all in the table. Uh, you can yeah. seek the presence of God there. You can be formed as the family of God there. And it can be a missional experience um, mm-hmm. as, as well. So, so that's happening. And then, and then our gatherings are geared around practicing the ways of Jesus together. Um, so what does it actually look like to practice those rhythms? Um, I think both Chase and I have had experiences in the past where, where we, we would watch ourselves say to people that we were pastoring, you should do these things and be about these things. And then realize maybe they didn't always know what that even looked like. They didn't have a a practice or a habit or a, or a rhythm in, in which to live into that. So we try to incorporate those things into um, the way we gather as well. So there's a, there's a participatory element to, to what's happening when you, when you come to a Kaleo gathering and, yeah. and then all of that, that climax is at the table, right? Like you, yeah. you can have all of these things that happen during a, a church service, right? Where you, where you pray, where you hug a friend, where you hear a, a, a word and you're convicted by the spirit, you, you sing and praise and, and like you just, you come alive with joy and all of those things that we're all experiencing individually, but together in the like, you know, more traditional gathering sense, we bring all of that then to the table together. And, and so to, to me, that's the thing that kind of shifts the, the way we do it. It's not, and it's never just to say like anybody who does something different 
is is out of line or wrong. We we're just saying we want to bring all of those things to the table. And so yeah. so maybe you're in a, a period of lament and and there's opportunity in that gathering to to cry out to the Lord. And so one who's who's full of joy and one who's full of lament, now they meet each other at the table. You know, one mm-hmm. who's experiencing homelessness and and one who just got a promotion, now they meet each other at the table. You know, one one who's suffering on the the, the ends of, of racism and, and one who's never acknowledged their privilege, now they're at the table. And and yeah. so it, it's like it's murky, it's messy, <laughs> it's all of those things. Yeah. Um but it's this it's it's shaped towards this like beautiful participation together, I guess, uh, yeah. is is the heart there. And this is something I'm really curious about because obviously I've only been to one, so I haven't <laughs> been able to experience on a consistent basis, right? Mm-hmm. But something that I'm really curious about is how do you um like encourage conversation? Do you just let it happen or- organically, or do you like say, okay, for this day, we're going to talk about this topic at this time. You know what I mean? Because the one that I went to, which was really cool, is it, we were experiencing Lent, right? And so you're we going through a whole series. And throughout every week, we we're talking about, um, we're going to be praying for this group of people in this country. And this food right. that we're going to eat at the table represents this country that we're going to be praying for. So I yeah, personally yeah. love, you know, again, it was one experience, but I loved how it was all yep. tied together with yep. even the experience the church was going through together. Yeah. Um, but on a week to week basis, how do you like give topics to people to talk about or do you just let the conversations happen naturally as, as they are? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, a, a little bit of both. We, we've never we've never said this is what we want you to talk about um, mm-hmm. at the table. I, I think that part of that is is our our emphasis and our belief that the, that the spirit is present there, too. And um, we've already guided people um, in. Um, in a communal gathering to to worship, to hear the voice of God together, to, to all of this. And so we're just believing that the Spirit will continue that movement to the table. Um, mm-hmm. But to what you're referencing, um, and I, and we do we do it uh, about once a month where we have a meal of rice and beans, and mm-hmm. and the intentionality of that is it's it's a simple meal that that you know the the majority of the world subsists on uh, what it costs essentially to to prepare rice and beans, um, for every meal. And so, um, that, that allows us to, to identify ourselves with, um, you know, the, the, the the poor of the world. It's also a really affordable meal. And so, (laughs) so we save money when we do that. And then we give that money to the, the different things we're a part of that, that care for those in need. Yeah. Um, so, so we do that on purpose, okay. but we, we always, we always follow, um, or rice and beans always typically tends to follow, um, one night where we do brisket. So, oh, so we okay. also, because, because the, the Lord's supper or communion or whatever, you know, you want to, uh, whatever you want to call it, I think tendence, a, a tendency in the, the Western evangelical churches, when you have, uh, when you receive communion, you, you do so um, kind of like with your head down in a, in a very uh, individually reverent heart, which is not, not wrong. Uh, but mm-hmm. I think we miss some of the joy and celebration present at the table as mm-hmm. well. Uh, that mm-hmm. God is in our midst that we are together. And so uh, we, we get in on that brisket game. To, we have a handful of people um, just on our meal team who, who love to get get on the grill and, and cook up brisket. So so we do it, you know, big or whatever, a little bit too, and, and try to just continually hold the tension of just the reality of the kingdom that the kingdom has arrived in Jesus, but but it's not fully realized the already, but not yet, uh, as a lot of people uh, say. So so we just try to live into those tensions um, okay. as well. So yeah, you know, I one reason why like what it, that what happens at Kaleo on a weekly basis, you know, granted things look a little different now, but it's so attractive to me because in the season of life that I'm in, I'm realizing how valuable the conversation piece is mm-hmm. um, in day to day life. You can't experience reconciliation without conversation. Right. Very rarely can you experience any type of healing in relationship without conversation. Yeah. 
yeah. very rarely can you grow and even even grow in any type of relationship, whether it's your relationship with God or a real yeah, yeah. relationship with a yep. friend or mentor yeah. or anything. Like yep. conversation is literally the conduit through which a lot of really great growth and healing and reconciliation takes place. Exactly. And that happens, you know, not just in the church world, but even when it comes down to race or political issues or what have you, when yep. you can willingly sit down in front of somebody else and try to understand their perspective, that happens to conversation and, and a willingness to understand and see where the other person's coming from. Yep. And the fact that a, you know, I've grown up in church and have worked in church for most of my life. I've been to a lot of different churches, a lot of different church events, but I've never in my life seen a church service done the way Kaleo's done, you know, and, and it's a, it's a newer church too, a newer church plant too. It's only yep. been around yep. for six months. Is that right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, yeah. it, it was just a really cool experience, yeah. you know, that, that I, when I went there and um, I'm really glad that Kendall introduced me to you and to Kaleo yeah, and everything. And he, like one of your other friends realized that, Hey, you're talking about the similar stuff that my friend Chris is talking about. You should check this out, you know? Yeah. So yeah. Um, that's really, really cool. Um, any yeah. other thoughts? Well, I wanted to ask you about your dissertation that you're writing. Yeah. Too, but I didn't yeah. Yeah, even just what you unpacked there too, because that, that would be another way we, the language that we use and the intentionality of the table is is just even the the picture that everyone has a seat at the table, right? Mm -hmm. So so everyone is invited to the table because, as we say, it's the Lord who invites you to the table. Jesus is the one inviting you to the table. He's the host of the table. So mm -hmm. so let us come together. Let us find that we all have a seat together. And I think a lot of those conversations that you even just named that we've now we've now flattened the, the the playing field if you will because you're mm -hmm. sitting face to face with one another you're sitting at yeah. the same level you, you, and and you're sharing something together when you do it so so you can't have a meal with someone and, and not have to look them in the eye not mm -hmm. not have to to be near them you know to to reach for something to ask for something mm -hmm. like that, that it's actually happening as as you do it you know mm -hmm. like you, those that practice is unfolding and and that's why the table when we come to it at, at the conclusion of our gatherings is intentional that it's not at the beginning that it's at the end mm -hmm. is that that we've we've all sought the lord together as a body that then's brought us to the table to have the dialogue we might need to have to hear about you know, somebody else's experience that we never would have known before yeah. um, to, to even maybe find ourselves in a bit of an uncomfortable situation, but every yeah. uncomfortable situation is improved by food. So, <laughs> right. So, so it's yeah. like, yeah, it can't be so bad um, <laughs> if that's the case, you know, and, and it's, and it's just kind of like the ultimate model of Jesus, right? Like how many times does the thing get all wonky and uncomfortable when Jesus is eating with people? Right. It's yeah. like that, it just keeps happening. You know, as a lot yeah. of people say, Jesus ate his way through the Gospels. So we're just like we're just trying to eat our way through being a, a church family. Um, That's really and the, cool. Yeah. I'd say, can I say one more thing to that, too, because you, you mentioned we're a church plant. Um, we're about six, six months into to gathering um, publicly. But we, we spent a year before we launched six months ago eating in homes together. So so we yeah. founded who we are as a as a church and who we're trying to become and all of those things on eating around at the table together where jesus was hosting us in our homes you know yeah. we would we would meet at homes and do that um so so that it would be uh the, the groundwork or the root system that would then influence how we actually practice that in yeah. public you know in the world so yeah fantastic thank you for sharing that um yeah i I really enjoyed when I got a chance to, to meet with you um, not too long ago, you were talking to me about the dissertation that you're writing. Um, and I think it's so unique because I've never thought of the Trinity um, as a leadership model mm -hmm. in life. Yeah, you know? yeah. And so I would love for you to explain that a little bit more um, yeah. and just share like the things that you're learning and the things that you're writing about in your dissertation. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for asking that. Um, I should clarify. I have, I'm hoping to write this. I'm still, I'm still like gathering all the information and okay. researching and stuff like that. So, so I'm like two months away from finishing uh, 
the, the third year of my, my doctorate program, which then I then have five years to write this dissertation, which uh, the good Lord should hopefully grant me a year and a half to finish that. But um, yeah, the, 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 the idea is, the general idea is, is this. Um, my, my doctorate program um, is, is an emphasis on, on the, the work of the Holy Spirit um, as, as it pertains to also just leadership in general. So it's a, it's a doctor of ministry. So it has like a praxis component to it. Um, it's not research heavy. It's, it's action heavy, I suppose. And, um, I, I then need to write a dissertation that incorporates both of those things. And so I set out in this doctoral program, um, uh, three years ago with this idea in mind, um, that is kind of in response to things I keep experiencing myself in in the world of church or however we we talk about that, but also see happening where a lot of um, solo leadership um, ends ends in some form of hurt uh, for for people involved and and so I, I just found myself often dreaming of of another way uh, of, of how do we lead and maintain um, health for ourselves as church leaders, but that, that, that health stays, um, stays true to trickle down through, through the body as well, through, through, through your congregation. And so shared leadership was something I cared about anyway. Um, and then I just started to see how that's modeled in the relationship of the Trinity. Um, Mm -hmm. so, so I, I, as a, theologian who's trying to write um something that that practice that practices well i have to figure out how to say that but i'm taking my cues from the way the trinity interacts so i have to be careful not to say it's simply a model for leadership mm-hmm. i'm trying to take my cues from the way and from what we see present in the the godhead father son and holy spirit and how mm-hmm. might that help us then as as we lead and, and mm-hmm. so that there's a couple of like key themes, I guess, um, that, that I'm working on unpacking and all of that. And, and so one, one way that we um, talk about the, the Trinity relating to itself, you know, to, to God's self is yeah. because I write it all. Anytime you try to start defining the Trinity, things like get all uh, get all wonky. Um, so so we've got Father, Son and Spirit moving together as one. Uh, a, a word given to that is, is perichoresis. And, and so it, it's, it's kind of summarized. It's so complicated that we don't actually like define that. We just let that word stand. But it, but it kind of means dancing together, moving together in unison. Mm-hmm. And the invitation that the, that the Trinitarian God gives us is to join in that. It's always the invitation to be, to be one with the Father, Jesus says, right? Just, just as he was one with the Father, that's the invitation there so okay so we see we see three moving together as if they're one right which they are one um Mm -hmm. but you like pull the pieces apart so Mm -hmm. okay what does that look like in leadership and then and then how does father son and holy spirit um participate with one another um another like ten dollar theological world word is is kenosis or or self-emptying Right. We see that most played out in Philippians 2, where Jesus emptied himself uh, of his divinity. Right. That that picture. So the idea being that each member of the Trinity is continuously emptying themselves out for the other while simultaneously being filled by the other. And then ironically enough, I just noticed this like that's what this picture actually represents right here, like is Mm. and and it's just like everybody's pouring in and moving together with, with yeah. everybody. So, okay. So if, if those are, are a couple things we see present in um, the Trinity, how do we lead then in a way in which we are continuously emptying ourselves and being filled, right? So, so if you're sharing leadership, you're essentially building in on purpose places mm-hmm. to practice the humility necessary to empty yourselves out but you're also practicing the humility necessary to receive from someone else. Mm-hmm. And, and I think those two things are really important to just balance in, in church leadership. 
So, yeah. so there's this movement together, like Chase and I at this point in time are, are co-pastoring, sharing leadership, and we're trying mm -hmm. to move as one. Like we're, right. we're trying to do that. And that doesn't mean you can't do that in a, a setting where there's like one lead pastor as we often know it, right? And, mm -hmm. and all of it doesn't mean it can't happen in that. We're trying to build in uh, a certain paradigm that almost um, forces us to stay true to that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, does that, do there are other yeah. questions from that or does that make sense? Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. And I really, really, it, it gets me so excited to hear you explain that because, you know, with my previous experience in ministry or even just in life, you know, any, anytime you're part of a team, you know, you experience the humanity of leadership models, right? And it's not that yes. any one leadership model is better Absolutely. than the other or right. perfect or anything like that. I, that's not what we're saying. I know that's not what you're no. saying. Yep, right. But one thing I appreciate about this, and I think um, it, it makes a lot more sense to me in experience because you know, this is the first time I have something in my life that I'm actively leading with someone else because like, yeah, you know, yeah. I run a small yep. business. Right. And I, we talked about this a little bit is that I'm constantly having to, and it's just like people in marriages as well, mm -hmm. like the humility it takes to consider and to receive the input from somebody else and to know yeah. that the decision Absolutely. that we're making is done together. But I've never yeah. quite seen it done with three as, yep. as, God does it himself in the Trinity. And it's just truthfully, just such a fascinating uh, like thought process to just yeah. think, you know, that even God does this himself is that mm -hmm. he considers the different forms of himself to lead his yeah. people to himself. You know, it's just, right. wow. Absolutely. Wow. I, I yeah. think like embedded in that too, because you're reminding me of things <laughs> that I think about when you're saying that mm -hmm. is, is often when you lead by yourself, which, I mean, this is, it's marriage is a good example of that too. But I think that, that, that breaks down a little bit more uh, at some point in terms of, of the dynamics of leadership, but people tend to want to maybe lead something by themselves because you get the final say, you can go a little faster, like those mm -hmm. sorts of things. But I think that the flip side of the benefits that, that you find in shared leadership are that it actually slows you down. Like you, you can't actually be in a hurry because mm -hmm. you need to make sure you're, you're in movement as one together. And I think that's, that, that's modeled the way Jesus lives his life. You know, like mm -hmm. I, I tend to say it a lot and there's smarter people who said it before me, but that Jesus is never in a hurry. So, so how do we model our leadership after that? Well, that's because Jesus walked in step with the spirit of God informed mm -hmm. by his time with the father. So there's this whole, uh, you know, dynamic at play that that essentially slows us down and mm -hmm. it also then means that our our vision our picture our the way we implement and practice is being refined by other voices um mm -hmm. and, there, and a decision can't already be made and then other voices are invited in which is right. sometimes a challenge that we find and and you know solo leadership or hierarchical leadership like whatever way you want to talk about that which again isn't all isn't all bad um, right right and then i then yeah. i think the thing oh sorry go ahead no please continue the the thing too like that i think bears saying too is right it, with within the trinity you have you have diversity within unity right like mm -hmm. the distinct persons of father son and spirit um have have unique roles almost right yet but there's oneness there and, and i think like in my current context not necessarily in writing a dissertation because i would unpack this in writing it but in my current context in practice a thing that we lack is diversity we have two white guys in a room and we are incredibly aware of that reality and no like we are we are moving towards paying attention to that how do we invite, yeah. in, invite voices in and who might be a third person we add to our team? Not because we want to directly model three people and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. I think it can happen with two. I think it can happen with four. Um, mm -hmm. but, but I think there's unity and diversity present in the Godhead. And, and so I take that cue and I go, oh, then yeah, that's really important too. Because you can't actually put on your leadership team 
of a church, especially like a church our size, a smaller church, you couldn't afford everybody for that matter. Yeah. Uh, you, like you, you, you couldn't put like every single view in every single person and every single experience on your team, but you can always uh, make sure your leadership is representative of those views. Mm -hmm. So in practicality as like a pastoral team, maybe maybe three is as, is as big as we can we can get well then you can build out a a council an oversight team an elder board whatever you want to call it that is still representative of the diversity uh needed to inform the oneness of the body of christ that, that you're right. leading wow chris you're just a really smart guy <laughs> really. So i mean not, or maybe i sound smart yeah you, I mean, you sound really smart, but I just appreciate just the thought process you have because it makes me think different um, about yeah. how I'm even living my life and maybe changing some things or trying different things, you know, in the day to day. Um, but I want to move into this conversation about the coronavirus and how it's um, affecting the church. Um, you know, in light of you being a co-pastor of Kaleo mm -hmm. um, and also realizing, hey, our congregation can't meet every week um we can't do that with people we're actively you know week week yeah. for week to week teach them um the ways of jesus necessarily from the pulpit um but before i get into the specifics of how it's affecting necessarily your church but the church at large how do you feel that something like this is affecting the church at large mm -hmm. um i mean so uh, I have thoughts and try to parse out my, my thoughts without being offensive. Um, I'll, I mean, I, let's, let's, not, let's say this up front, right? Nobody I know knows how to lead a church during a pandemic, right? Like, cause no, nobody studied that in seminary. Nobody has previous experience uh, doing that, it, especially in, in even just like our, our American church context, like, no, nobody knows that. Um, and I think that's like, okay, let's be humble enough to acknowledge that as opposed to like give a sound bite to all the things that are out there. And I think that's mm -hmm. a thing I see happening, at least initially, is that everybody, I, not everybody, a lot of people were tempted to have an immediate sound bite to what was unfolding and what it would mean for the church and, and all of that. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so personally, uh, you know, Chase and I felt like we didn't want to add another voice to uh, the, the plethora of voices that, that were kind of like just shouting into the Internet, I guess, at that point, because none of us were gathering together. Um, yeah. so, so, so big picture, like, man, everybody's immediately hit with this, like, how do you react to anything when you can't be together? Like nobody would have even ever thought that was a thing. So I think a lot of people yeah. moved immediately to a certain platform to to maintain as, as much semblance of normalcy as possible. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think what it's doing to the, the, the American church or the, the Western church, whatever you want to say, uh, is it's asking, it's causing us to ask questions about like, what does it mean to be uh, a body of believers? Like what's represented there and how do we keep it going and all of those things. And so we're evaluating all of the means and tools uh, to do that. You know, some churches are super equipped to, you know, just boom, pop the thing up online. Everybody can check in. They were probably already doing that. A lot of churches who are more <laughs> equipped to do that, um, mm -hmm. you know, and in, in our context where we're a, you know, six months old, the the ethos of who we are is centered around like being with one another. So like, yeah. how do you recreate a, a meal, right? Then we have all of these conversations of like, do, how do you have communion online? Like all of those things are, are there. Yeah. Um, but, I, but I think a big thing that I'm, I'm watching happen is um, I think there's this challenge that's, that's un, going, to, going to happen beneath the surface um, we won't see what happens from it for a little while now, but I think that this season's revealing a little bit of um, uh, our, and I mean, I mean pastorally, and I mean um, church people, uh, our addiction to the sermon, our our addiction to somebody to 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 come up and tell us what it is that go is going on and what God might have to say about it, um, and I'm not sure we really realized the 
how much that was true until we all like saw our faces plastered all over all of our feeds telling everybody, this is the thing we're doing. This is the thing we're doing. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and so, so I should caveat too. I don't, I don't believe that um, God sent coronavirus to teach us something. Um, yeah. I think that the g- coronavirus um, can teach us something though. And, mm-hmm. and, I, and I think that's, we find ourselves in this like weird in between of like, what is that? And I personally am, am seeing this as a unique opportunity to, to retrain ourselves, to, to grow our roots down into God's love, like Paul says in, in Ephesians 3, and, and hear from God afresh ourselves mm-hmm. and, and then bring that to the community, that that we would awaken each each person's um, individual capacity to hear from God, that that we would would guide people to that place. Because now coming to our thing on Sunday and hearing a word from the preacher isn't the same. It's not the same when you just sit in your house and do it. Like so so that the communal component is lost. And, and you find community in a, in a triune God, right? Like the, to yeah. come back to that place. And, and so I, mm-hmm. I'm not sure I'm answering your question at all, other than I'm, I'm circling around it in the sense that I, I think what I hope happens is, is that people are drawn to let their roots grow deep into God's love and to hearing God's voice afresh. And, and that perhaps in this time, the, the American church or the, the Western church breaks down the model that we've actually kind of swung back towards where, where it's almost like Moses has to go up on the mountain and hear from the Lord. And he comes down and he tells the people what God said. And they're all like a, afraid of what Moses is telling. They're like, don't get too close with the whole God thing. We don't actually even want to go up there on our own. And, right, and, right. and I think we, we in, inadvertently trained ourselves in that because um, we like to hear from people. You know, like, mm-hmm. I, which is okay. We do like to hear from yeah. people, you know. Um, but but I think there's something else that's happening there where we're where we're passing it out to, uh, or we have the potential to pass it back out to the people. And then when we gather again, we have this this community of people who have sought the voice of God together, heard God speak to them, filled them fresh mm-hmm. with the movement of the Spirit, and we went back out into the world now believing that actually we all have access to the voice of God. That God wants to speak to every single one of us and guide us along the way. Man, that is so enlightening, so powerful. And you're, you're giving language to things I've been feeling a lot lately Mm -hmm. myself, you know, so, you know, it makes me ask what, what does it mean when somebody asks you, do you go to church? What Mm -hmm. does that mean? You know, like, yeah. Okay immediately your mind goes, well, I'm going to a building, but then mm-hmm. is the building the church? Absolutely not. It's the people, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And the people can't gather. So it really makes you just ask like what you're saying, breaking that down. Who, what is the church and what is my role in God's yeah. body and, and God's yep. church? And am I yep. playing my role effectively? And it also, it's a lot harder to, get really quiet and seek God for yourself and get a word for yourself. Not that it's hard because if you, if you talk to God, he will talk back to you. I'm not saying that that's hard, but it's easier to press play and listen to what God showed somebody else than it is to really seek the Lord for yourself and say, Lord, what is it that you have for me in the season of my life? What is it that you have for me in the season for my family? You know, and really get an answer for that because it cost Moses a lot to go up to the mountain. Totally. It cost him a lot. Like, you know, like mm-hmm. yeah. it's costly to behold the face of God yourself, yeah. you yeah. know, and yep. it's difficult because, you know, not everybody agrees with that word or, you know, not everybody wants to hear that word or whatever. Yeah, right, right. But like you said, you know, I, I would agree. I don't, I wouldn't, I would never say that God sent coronavirus here to do something, you know, to people. Yeah. But I do think that there is wisdom in observing what the coronavirus can teach us in this time, especially as God's global church and us being a part of different entities of churches around, you know, 
especially the American Western church, because that's mainly what my experience lies in. Yep, same. Um, but, you know, putting your roots down deep into hearing from the Lord yourself and then being able to come to your church, your church, your local yeah. church community gathering to yeah. give and impart and encourage somebody else with whatever the Lord is sharing with you. Mm-hmm. Not that you can't ever go to those things and, and receive, but it's just a different mentality. Um, my right. dad, like, are you going to let him answer the question? Daddy already answered the question. <laughs> this is part two. Yeah. <laughs> this is part two. But um, no, I really do appreciate you explaining that. Um, that's my dad, Lashley. I love and my it. mom's I love getting it. on from. So they're on. Hello, mom and dad. Um, but yeah, you got me all distracted, dad, now. But I'm like, I don't even know what I was going to ask him next. But, but no, I think that that's really just really enlightening and um yeah i don't know if you have any other thoughts like when it comes yeah to, uh, yeah I, I mean i think like because because you what you said again made me think about this is that y- you said it's easier to push play than than to maybe even believe that god wants to speak to you um and let alone creating any type of space to to do that um and and i think it, it it bears mentioning that I know the reality is that not everybody actually can go, Oh, I'm going to go be quiet in my room for the next 30 minutes. Like I, you know, I've got, I know plenty of single moms who are at home with with four kids now that are all trying to learn together. Or, you know, I have friends who are in and out of, you know, homelessness right now. Oh, they, what, where's he going to go to do that right now? I mean, maybe on the move. Yes. So, so Mm -hmm. I think like to, to our mainstream, accessible to online technology group of people we have the the temptation to push play instead Mm -hmm. of create space to uh, humbly seek the presence of god to hear god's voice Uh, and and i think as you were saying that too it reminds me just of the reality that it's it's actually the the ways of jesus are never easy following Jesus is never an easy thing. Like to, to give up your life and, and sacrifice and empty yourself and all these things that we've been talking about, those aren't easy, but, but they're worth it. Yeah. And I think that's what I want. I so want people to see on the other side of, of, of a season in which we're stuck in this place and we're not totally sure what it means. It is that, is that if we use this time to, to say, God, what do you want me to know about this? And then what do you want me to do? As opposed to maybe just the season of why, because mm-hmm. um, I, I don't think we're going to get a good why it's all happening. Because now we're, it's a problem of evil and we ask all of these questions, right? Like all of that's layered. Right. But I think if we can ask God, God, what do you want me to know in this season? And then what do you want me to do? I mean, I think I could say 100%. God will answer that question if you ask him that question. Like, yeah. God wants to speak to us so much more than, like, pastorally, I want God to speak to, to somebody in my congregation. He already wanted that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like, like and, he yeah. wants, and he wants to have the intimacy to communicate it with us uh, mm-hmm. as well. Like, that, that's so much more beautiful. Think of anything you've ever heard from the Lord. If, you know, that the, the preacher had told you that, or you had the encounter yourself, like, right, you take yeah. the encounter every single time. Um, mm-hmm. and, I, and I think it's fair to say too, right, like that, it, that's, it is hard work to engage in, in continually seeking God's voice because it's not always like, boom, do this, boom. And sometimes it's like a tiny little thing and he's just like, I just want you to know I love you. That's mm-hmm. it, you know, like, it's like a little, it's just the, the whisper of that. And then you like walk away, you're like, so what am I supposed to do with that? He's like, you're just <laughs> supposed to be loved. You know, like, like sometimes it yeah. can be that simple, right? It's not always mm-hmm. like, what's the one dream that you're going to accomplish? Like sometimes he tells you that, but not always. And so I think that's tied up uh, mm-hmm. in this season as well. Um, yeah. And that, that's my heart is that, is that we during this season as, a, as Kaleo, that, that we would learn uh, we would learn and we would practice and we would form habits and a heart and a desire and a hunger to hear God's voice and discern what it is he's saying to us and what he wants us to know and then what he wants us to do. So That's powerful. I, I had this other thought as you were saying all of that, just about, you know, seeking God's voice and how, you know, a single mom might not have 30 minutes of quiet to be able to seek God's voice or whatever. Um, I'm also just realizing because growing up in church, 
you can tend to look to like systems and processes of this is exactly how you hear God's voice. And then you find yourself modeling after uh, in order to hear God or spend time with God. It looks like 15 minutes of worship, 15 minutes of yeah. reading my Bible, yep. 15 minutes right. of journaling, 15 minutes of praying for, right. you know, this list of 10 people that I've created. And if I do all yeah. of those things, then that equals a time. With yes. God, right? yes, right. Yeah. Um, instead of allowing yourself to really see the relationship aspect and the conversation yep. aspect of my relationship with you, it's going to look very different than your mother's relationship with you. Yep, Not exactly. because we have wrong relationships with you, but just because we're very different p- people. So our approach right. to conversation with you is going to look very different. So yeah. maybe for that single mom, her approach to a relationship with God in a certain season is going to look very different from mine versus Absolutely. my parents or my friends, yes. you know? So I, I, I bring light to that because I want people to be encouraged to whatever your relationship with God looks like, as long as there's conversation and growth in relationship, right. that's really right. it. Totally. That, that that's why, like when when we talk about the w- early on the uh, with Kaleo, the rhythms of Jesus, right? The 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 humbly seek the presence of God, be formed as the family of God to join the mission of God. That I always see that as a spiral, right? Like which I can't do with my hands, but you get the idea, right? Like that it, that, it's, it. that it's all like intertwined and interacting with one another. So it doesn't, to, to seek the presence of God, to, to humbly go after the presence of God doesn't mean like, hey, I'm gonna need 30 minutes in this room over here. Sometimes it might, but it also might just be a whole way of seeing the world, which is what Jesus did. That Jesus mm-hmm. encountered that everywhere. And I, and I think mm-hmm. it's a, so it's a, it's not just a do this, do this, do this. It's a whole different way to live. It's a whole different way to see the world. It's an awareness that the spirit is with you always and God is ever present. And that invitation to live in the rhythm of Jesus is tied into all of those things, you know? Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, Chris, for people who just want to find, find more about Kaleo or just follow yeah. you on what you're doing or just stay in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, well, probably Instagram at Kaleo PHX. Um, that's, I don't know. So like, that's such a funny, it's a funny thing. Cause it was even like my, like, hold on, do I really want to do this with Aaron? You know, like <laughs> that, that sort of thing, because, because that's probably not necessarily like my MO to, yeah. to announce the thing. And, um, uh, we don't we don't promote our church, so to speak, because because we believe that if we can continue to invite people into these rhythms of Jesus, that it that it will be who, the people who need to be there, you know, like it'll be the person that got invited. You know, it won't necessarily be because they they saw um, a post or you know they got something in the mail or whatever. Um, yeah. So I, you could, I mean, that, that's probably one way to, to do it. I, we're trying to figure out, like, do we want to post sermons and, you know, like our spiritual practice guides, like I know you've been a part of those and that we email out, yeah. um, you know, so, so maybe something like that. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, that, that's probably at our website, kaleopHx.com someday, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> so. No, I love it. And I appreciate that, you know, like, it's, yeah. I think it's like completely okay. And um, I have, like, so much respect for the way that, you know, you guys lead and, and run um, Kaleo, you. you know. So um, I, I appreciate the honesty there, you know. I, I don't think yeah. there's any, like, perfect way to do it. But, yeah, if you can yeah. stay in touch with you there. And I almost forgot. This is one question I do ask all of my guests before we close. Um, this, this podcast was created for millennials who want to make an impact in their communities, you know, whatever mm-hmm. that is. It's not just full-time ministry. is isn't just church. Totally whatever your hand finds to do to make eternal impact, you know? So yeah. what's one piece of advice, final piece of advice that you would give to other millennials out there who want to make impact? I, I mean, you're the only person that has ever been made that way. Like, so, so God has a unique identity and destiny for each person. Ask God mm-hmm. what it is and, and then ask him what you should do. I, I think that's probably like upside down a little bit um, mm. to, to maybe what we what we hear always. Um, but if I was to then just like beat a dead horse, I'd say the other thing to make an impact, learn to live the rhythms of the life of Jesus, where you seek the presence of God, are joined as the family of like, you know, formed as the family. Yeah. And, 
join the mission. Like, just like put, put that, put that together, live, live in step with the spirit of God. And, and then the, the impact will unfold in front of you, you know? So, yeah, that's good. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for your time. This has been exactly what I hoped it would be. Okay, good. I, I <laughs> wanted it to be for you. Yeah. Okay. And I just appreciate you taking the time to just, you know, come on here and just uh, allow us to share this conversation t- with other people. I, I really do think it'll encourage a lot of people, especially during this pandemic and yeah. just really appreciate you. And thank so. you so much. Yes. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you so much. All right. Have a good one. All right. Good to see you. Bye.